Petrone, a consultant, is a senior level doctor in the United Kingdom who has a specialty. And Lorenzo's is as a consultant vascular interventional radiologist with his main area of interest in the cardiovascular field. He is an expert in minimally invasive procedures. Now, what I want to focus on in particular at first is innovation in diagnostics and treatment surrounding artery blockages. It's a growing field with plaque buildup becoming more and more of a problem with our aging populations. It's such a big issue in the U.S. in particular that doctors here are even breaking off from hospitals and starting their own outpatient laboratories to perform procedures that clear these blockages in a minimally invasive way that doesn't require a hospital stay. New technology is allowing them to do so in a better, safer, faster, and less expensive way. And in those outpatient labs, doctors don't have to cut through all those you know, red tape and and such of hospital administrators to get approval to adopt the latest and greatest in innovation. Now in the UK, Lorenzo, you don't have that luxury to really break away. So I'm curious as to what the innovation cycle is like in the UK and how cutting edge this system really is there. Do you feel that you have the best treatment options available to you for treating patients as compared to other parts of the world? Oh, okay, thank you very much for your question. It's really a pleasure for me to be here with you today. And I think, yes, UK is going the right way and the whole world, I think, is the right way because it's uh, still uh, uh, the surgery is going less and less invasive and that's a really good thing for the patients. So instead of doing bypasses nowadays, most of the patient can be treated with just a small hole and go home the same day instead of having, you know, a long in the hospital stay. And actually in UK, I think the patients are getting a good treatment. You know, the patient in the NHS is for everyone. It's not, uh, uh, no one is required to pay any kind of uh, um, insurance. And I think we are able to access the latest technology, but the thing is like, you need to find the right way to use it for the right patient. And that's the challenge every day. So to, to give the best treatment to every patient and we try to tailor the treatment to every single patient. Now there's a big push here in the States for a social system and some entrepreneurs are really concerned that that could stifle innovation. What are your thoughts and in, in what is your best advice for those who want to not simply get CE mark, but to actually infiltrate the hospital system and get their technology in your hands, in the doctor's hands. So I mean, like uh, all the companies, of course, who are always launching a product, they're always going for two different markets. One is the US market and one is the European market. Right. Uh, usually we use, uh, of course, uh, you know, there are different levels of treatments. I would say the first level of treatment, which should be for everyone, is the basic, you know, uh, angioplasty and basic vascular procedures. And then the second level of treatment, which is the high level specialized treatment, which is for few centers, which could... Uh, lead the way and get you know the most difficult cases, the most challenging ones, and also the third level is the research. So research is something which is uh, really helpful and really developed in UK. So some centers are able to treat patients, uh, involving them in, uh, of course, uh, uh, randomized controlled trials where you can use the latest technology involving the patient in this kind of race towards getting the best treatment for everyone. So let's talk more specifically about peripheral artery disease. It's plaque buildup for those that don't know, it's plaque buildup in the peripherals, mainly the legs. But what we've discovered here in the US is that three out of five people who have a heart attack actually have plaque buildup in the legs as well, which means that if a doctor measured blood flow in the legs for everyone over the age of 50, because one in 20 people over the age of 50 actually have peripheral artery disease, it actually could give a strong indication of who's most at risk for heart attack and stroke. What are the parameters there for diagnostics? And do you find that you think that these people should be, everybody should be tested sooner for plaque buildup? So I think, you know, the peripheral artery disease is a big family and is divided in different levels. So I think, you know, the last stage is CLI which means mm -hmm. critical limb ischemia. This is the most, you know, uh, powerful uh, disease 
uh, against patients. So it's something that she really uh, could be, the diagnosis of CLI could be really uh, bad. It's one of the worst diagnoses you can get. After lung tumor is the, the one which has the highest prevalence and higher mortality at five years. So I think, you know, the patients should be stratified in symptoms. So people with peripheral artery disease can go between someone who, can, who can't walk for more than 200 meters to someone who has really, uh, is really at risk to lose the leg. So I think, you know, if you stratify the patients in the right way and everyone gets, of these people, gets simple tests like a duplex scan, a BPI test, just to check how the blood flow is, then, you know, you can add to the clinical data, also the lab data, and you can try to understand who needs the treatment and who doesn't. Right, the key is just early diagnostics. I mean, it can save life and limb. Of course, you know, especially when people have ulcer. Uh, if you reach the level of the ulcer, that means you have CLI. So for these people, it's mandatory to get a diagnosis, to get a clinical, you know, of course, diagnosis, and to have a lab diagnosis. For these patients, you don't have to lose time. You know, the, the, the rate of amputation just for malpractice, let's say, because you are delaying the treatment, you are delaying the diagnostic, it's incredibly high. Still in US, as in UK, as, a, as a, in any other part of the world. And we have to act on these patients, to get them uh, diagnosed early and treated even earlier. It sounds like the patient profile is for you is pretty much at the point of CLI. I mean, that's the same here in the U.S. because people with peripheral artery disease are incredibly underserved. Absolutely, especially because sometimes they, they just also neglect their pathology and just, you know, they're, they are a bit alone in their fight. So they don't have the power, they don't have, you know, the effort to go through this battle. They prefer not to look at their foot where the foot is going, you know, black, black and more black. And they, despite going to a doctor and to say, doctor, I have this kind of problem which is affecting my life and I can't even go out for food shopping because my foot is, you know, uh, is completely damaged by the pathology. It seems that there just is plenty of time for the diagnosis. Do you find that doctors are just brushing off uh, people's complaints or patients' complaints as just part of aging? And yeah. when they should be saying, hey, you have leg pain, you have soreness and cramp in your legs. Why not just do an ABI test or a duplex ultrasound? No, that's, ba that's the basic, you know. But uh, I think there are two different levels. First is to get to the patients, to let them understand you know, that if they have a small ulcer, this can become a drama. Because sometimes people with diabetes have a small ulcer just cutting their nails. And then, you know, the ulcer become bigger and bigger and then it, it gets infection. So this is the first level, so the, the, the patient level. Then the other one is the, the, the doctor level where people need to be aware that the pathology, especially when, you know, affecting patients on dialysis or patients with uh, diabetes can evolve really quickly. So the conservative management can just be uh, decided by a vascular doctor because if all the doctors decide about vascular management, then sometimes we get patients to our center where the situation sometimes is too, uh, too, too bad to give it to, to give them a treatment and to save the whole leg. Sometimes you, you need a you know, minor amputation or transmetatarsal amputation. That means you're gonna lose half of the foot. So awareness is a problem for patients and for doctors. Would you say that one more than the other? Because I, I feel like here right now, we are taking the opposite approach because the doctors aren't do, doing the diagnosing. So we're trying to educate the patients to lobby the doctors to do the diagnosing. So it's like the patient's educating the doctors. No, the patient needs to go to the doctor because if the patient doesn't do. go to the doctor, yeah, the, the doctor it doesn't want to know, yeah. And so it's go important to- the doctor, to... don't yeah. hide your foot. Ask me, you know, I always say, I have this one ad that I put out on social media that says, you know, ask me doc, please take off your socks. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly that. And also, you know, just walk to the doctor because sometimes, you know, people are even, you know, they feel ashamed, they feel, yes. uh, they feel sorry for themselves, they feel miserable, so they don't even want to go to the doctor to say, oh, listen, I have this foot which is smelly and there's an infection going on, there's some necrosis. It's something that, if, that if some patients have really difficulty to face. Yeah, but you have a lot of really proud people and they don't even show their loved ones. So when their loved ones come over, they just stay in bed and keep their feet covered. 
Exactly, exactly, exactly. Do you find, one of the doctors here was telling me that a lot of people who have di are, who are diagnosed with diabetic neuropathy actually are relieved of symptoms when they have an interventional treatment for peripheral artery disease. So they actually have peripheral artery disease, but they're not being checked for that or diagnosed with that or treated with that because the doctor just says, oh, it's just neuropathy. Exactly. But I mean, it's, 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 next level, and they said, hey, let's check your arteries as well, not just with an ABI because that can have a false negative, but with a duplex ultrasound or beyond. Um, the treatment course. could actually be the symptoms. Of course, yes. Of course, yes. There's a there's a, there's much much more than neuropathy because sometimes you know patients even with the, the one with diabetes they don't even feel the pain. But they, mm -hmm. that's why also sometimes sometimes patients are feeling the pain and the pain is neglected by the doctors. Sometimes even you know the 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 the, 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 the patient doesn't feel the pain and so they don't go to the doctor. And say, okay, so it's a more ulcer, but just because they have diabetes, they just don't feel that you know the ulcer is progressing. So I think, you know, an early diagnosis for these kind of patients is, is key. It's really key. So many patients have reached out online um, from the UK saying they just do not feel served by their vascular surgeons there. And they have bypass as their only option or amputation is your next option. So, well, walk as far as you can. And when you can walk no further, we will go ahead and do bypass or we will amputate. What hope do you have for these patients that are coming online going, oh my gosh, that's not good. What can I do? I think there are different, different kind of patients, you know, for, especially if I would say for 90 plus percent of the patient, endovascular treatment should, uh, could and should be planned. I mean, the vascular uh, field is a really complex one and there's space for every kind of procedure. So the bypass is still a good option, especially for patients with, with ulcer. But for most of the patients, you know, endovascular treatment can give the same results as literature say, as the bypass, but with less effort uh, for the patient. You know, it's, it's you know, the, the, the healing time is faster and also the, the possibilities of getting a, a sovereign infection is lower so I think an endovascular treatment should be offered to everyone as a first line. Be, but the fact is it's not. So how can these patients better navigate the system? I've asked a couple, I've said, hey, why don't you go see this doctor or that doctor? And they say, well, I can't get a referral there from mine. How can they navigate this system and get to you, for example, if you can give them hope? No, I mean, like, as I said before, there are different levels of treatment. So some patients really need a full package of, you know, complex endovascular recognition and complex wound management. And that's why centers like mine are really taking care of this kind of patients with diabetic foot. That's, they are continuously, every week we have a diabetic foot meeting where different specialists meet all together to discuss the most challenging patients. These patients, especially in UK, they can go to every doctor they want they can be referred to every doctor they want in the UK, within the UK. So for a patient from Scotland, if the GP wants to refer to London, to a particular doctor, they, they can have this possibility. But sometimes people don't know. And people just, you know, go to the local hospital. Sometimes the skills are not up to date or there's not the same effort and not the same team. It depends. It depends a lot on where are you, you know, where are you. So what exactly would I say to someone who said, oh my gosh, my vascular surgeon said that he or she can't treat me. I have no other option. I can't even get a hold of anyone. What do I do? We see this a lot inside the social media groups. What should no, we do? I mean, I mean, as centers, I work in Northwest London. We're more than happy to see patients from every part of UK. So we, as, as I said before, we are going to see a patient from Aberdeen which uh, on Friday, I'm going to see this patient is going to be a patient who has been diagnosed, of course, with peripheral artery disease, lost already one leg, is from 1963, and now the other leg is in pain, just rest pain and no tissue loss. And uh, they said in, in, the, in these local centers, there's nothing they can do but amputation. So I felt, of course, we need to do something for this patient. This patient is coming to us on Friday, it's going to be full assessment and probably the treatment straight away on Monday. So we can do a lot for these patients. They need to know that we are here for them. 
and uh, I think we can give them hope and we can give them treatment and we can try to save more limbs. So when you talk about treatment, what is the treatment that you give them? Of course, you mentioned angioplasty, and we always talk here about it's better if, when you get angioplasty to try and have the lowest barometric pressure as possible so as to not cause a lot of trauma to the vessel, ultimately leading to quicker restenosis rates and then mm. quicker to have to get retreated again. Um, but then the next step is atherectomy which is the physical removal of plaque. Yeah, I mean, there are different steps. It depends on the skill of the doctor. Uh, I think you need to choose the right device for the right lesion. Sometimes, you know, you have to stent. Sometimes you have to do a tracheotomy. Sometimes you have to do angioplasty. I think, you know, you can't say in a whole my patient, I do that. No, my patient, I do the other thing. Uh, I think you need to tailor the treatment to all the patients. You know, every patient is, is different. Every lesion is different. And uh, we need to be wise and we need to be expert in choosing the best treatment for the best, for the best so patient. What tools do you have in your atherectomy tool chest? Orbital, directional, rotational, laser? There are two lasers that are out there on the market. Yeah, I mean, we have, we have different type of atherectomies. We don't use laser in our center. Uh, we do have, for example, access to directional atherectomy devices, which I think are, are really good because you can direct the, you know, the, the blades towards the plaque, what it is, instead of having you know, just a drill inside the artery where sometimes it slips on the plaque, which is on the side. So I think we can do a lot. But, and just for the technical side is really important, but also the wound management is, I want to focus on that sometimes because it's, that's really important to have a, a weekly check on this patient. You, you have recanalized. If you can do, you can have the best result ever, but then if the patient doesn't get the care that he needs or she needs, then you know, all this work or this amazing recanalization is just a waste of time. Exactly. So, and, and we're going to get to compliance and, and kind of that full, you know, patient care in a moment. But what is your, your typical approach for these patients? Are you, you know, do you do uh, contralateral? Do you do pedal? You know, are you kind of that, you have that, uh, the ability to do kind of every approach possible, whatever's best? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, you know, the, the best thing for these patients getting a normal actual approach from the same groin so you can reach down to the foot. And actually, I'm a big fan of race weight approach at the level of the pedal vessels, mm -hmm. which could be a really useful tool because it's really, uh, I mean, it's just a simple needle, a simple wire, so it's not something really invasive, but it can give, a, you know, sometimes when you can't recognize on the top, sometimes you see, I've presented many congresses, like it could be like a walk in the park to come from below, the wire just flies into the artery and then you can reopen the, the vessels really nicely from this approach, which many people don't do because they feel right. scared. They feel like they can't do it. It's technically challenging. But personally, I think more or less 30, 30 to 40% of my, of my patient get really good results with the, with the retroid approach. No, that's fantastic because I was in France observing patients' um, cases and there was a no stump SFA. And the doctor was like, well, nothing we can do. And we said, well, wait a minute. Can you, you know, get tibial access? And he said, huh, I've never tried that. So he did it for the first time then and there, and it was successful. But so oh, I, came, I came back from Barcelona last week where I just did a long presentation about the rate rate access at the level of the peroneal artery, which is one of the vessels which is most challenging because it's deep, but sometimes it's the last resource of blood flow to the foot. So it's mandatory sometimes to open this vessel because if you don't open this, you really don't have any blood flow, direct blood flow to the foot. So, I mean, I, I gave a talk about 20 minutes, you know, and people were like, oh yeah, we need to try. And sometimes you need to show people that it's not that rocket science so everyone can do everyone needs to try because especially when we're talking about limb salvage you need to try your best because if you don't recanalize you will lose the limb so there's no excuses not to do you know not to try the best treatment for the patient one other thing that we tell patients here because we find it's an issue in in several hospitals is that the doctor will go in and they will perform atherectomy. They'll remove the plaque, let's say, in the SFA. They'll clear the blockage, but then they won't do a bullish chase all the way down to check the runoff and make sure the outflow is fantastic. And so there may be some distal emboli that went down into the, you know, um, you know, below the knee and blocked somewhere else. Their toes turning purple. You know, they don't notice all of this stuff. So I always tell a patient, 
make sure that they check the outflow before you leave. Of it's course, this is mandatory before and after because even sometimes the patients have a multilateral disease. So sometimes clinicians really focus on the SFA, which is the superficial femoral artery, which is the artery at the level of the thigh. But sometimes, you know, you would never do a bypass on a patient who doesn't have any outflow because the bypass would, will go down. And the mm -hmm. same is for endovascular treatment. You can't stop treating the patient from the groin to the knee joint. Sometimes you have to extend the treatment. You need to check before and after because if the vessels there are occluded, whatever you have done, you know, higher up, it's completely nonsense. It's completely useless. And what do you think, um, here when you go onto the FDA's website and you look at the section, it's called MAUD, M-A-U-D-E, and it's where they report the adverse events. Doctors are required to report a, um, adverse events and they're posted there. The guide wire is the number one reported cause of adverse events. How do you minimize the trauma caused by a guide wire? I think it's, it's mainly two things. To choose the right guide wire for the right patient. So sometimes you have to use wires which are really sharp to go through really calcified plaque. Sometimes you have used wires which are really floppy to not to damage the artery while you're passing. So that's the first thing. And second thing is like to try to be really careful in the imaging you're taking just to understand, you know, how much you can push, how much you need to push. And sometimes, you, sometimes there are people who are giving like, of course, uh, uh, not a standard treatment, so they're going just below, you know, the, 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 the standard of care. Sometimes there are people who want to do too much and then they make things even worse. And when should stents be used? Here we advise patients to um, talk to their doctor about the minimal use of stents and to try and just minimize the trauma to the vessel during the procedures so that a stent may not be necessary for the legs in particular. Mm, yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, usually patients, when you are talking about them, about stenting, they say, but will the stent stay with me forever? And you say, yes. And then you have to be really aware of that. You know, and if the patient is asking you because the patient cares, and if you realize that the stent it's not something like just to make the image look better, but you know, it's also something that will stay forever with the patient. Usually sometimes I joke with the patient and say, a stand is like a diamond, is forever. You know, like a, a, there's a famous company of diamonds here in, a, in, a, in Europe, which makes this as the centers of their, of their spot. So the stand will stay with the patient forever. The stand can occlude, the stand can be damaged, especially the stand can rupture, you know, the, I mean, of course, you're trying to be as less uh, stenting as possible, but at the same time, you need to use the stent when you think that there could be a significant recoil. So again, it's not like you should avoid use a stent. Use use a stent when it's necessary, and sometimes right, just you know frontline treatment. Of course, you know, of course. But if, if, if the vessel, because sometimes you can, you know, use a threctomy, whatever you want. But if the vessel is recoiling, if you don't put the stand, then the patient will reocclude in, in two hours. And then the patient won't benefit from any treatment you have done. So it's about your expertise. It's about your wisdom. It's about your, your knowledge. And you have to choose the stand at the right moment. Of course, trying to uh, avoid the use of the stand as much as possible. Because as I said, the stand is forever. And we always say to the patient as well, we have a list of questions we give to patients here. And in one of the questions is, um, you know, hey doc, when you're stenting, can you please make sure that if you do in fact use a stent that you cover the entire treatment area? <laughs> of course, yes. And also there are different kinds of stents. And when people want to save some few, uh, you know, hundreds of pounds on stents, I always say, you know, if it was your leg or the leg of your brother or your father, would you save some really like 200 pounds on a stent because if you think it's, it's safe to do, you know, with a less competitive stent or would you use the best technology ever? The stent is forever again. The stent, if it was my leg, I would, have, I would like to have the best stent on the market in, in it. Yep, that gold standard. And people have to realize that when they do have a stent, they should check in with their doctor every three to four months just to get it checked. Mm, yeah, I mean, it's important. We always do, for example, at six uh, weeks, we check on patients. Of course, we, we check after, after the treatment before discharging them, but also we check at, uh, at uh, six weeks for the normal PAD patients, peripheral disease patients. For the ones who have ulcers, we check on them every week because it's really important to get, you know, a good feedback from them and from their wounds. And which leads us to compliance. 
which is when someone does get a stent in them, they have to stay on those blood thinners at least a year. Yeah, I mean, like it's, uh, for, um, for me, like for all the patients that uh, receive a stent, uh, one single antiplatelet is forever, and two single antiplatelet is RC at least for three to six months. And of course, they need to to to, to comply to the therapy. Sometimes patients think they are taking too many pills because also we always have to remember that sometimes CLI patients are often on uh, multiple therapies for multiple diseases. So mm -hmm. sometimes I say, okay, one pill less, one pill more, it doesn't make any, 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 any issue, but actually it does. So you need to be really careful in you know, warning them, if I put a stent, you need to take these pills because if not, the chances of the stent going down are real high. It's the same as stop smoking. That's such an important and key point. These patients sometimes, they have, they have nothing else than smoking, so you need to stop them from smoking to get the best patency of the stent. Because you can't blame the doctor, you can't blame the stent. Sometimes you need to blame the attitude that is still carried on without any kind of input from the doctors themselves. So you need to refer the patient to some centers where they can treat the dependency from tobacco. And this is key. Sometimes it's even more important than the treatment you can give to the legs, you know, the, to the balloon or to the stent you're going to put. It was interesting, we were in, the, in Utrecht and we were observing one of the cases and the doctor, they were going through the basics, the name, date of birth, et cetera, et cetera, and the doctor turns to the patient, hey, it says in the chart, I told you that if you didn't stop smoking, I wouldn't treat you, have you stopped smoking? And the guy says, well, I mean, no, I have, you know, one earlier. And the doctor says, okay, I'm done, send him out and literally fired the patient and sent him out the door. He was that. Yeah, this is the, this is the, typical, German, uh, uh, the typical German attitude. If you don't stop smoking, I won't give you any treatment to you. It could sound a little bit rude, but in some extent, it's like if you start doing this, people will really stop smoking. They will realize if you don't stop smoking, you know, all the effort you put, and so it's a bit of a balance, you know, and usually I really strongly suggest pay people to stop smoking. If a really bad situation, say if you don't stop smoking, especially people who are smoking like 40 cigarettes a day, then, you know, you don't, you don't deserve any treatment because you're going to be, you're going to, you know, uh, you're going to be the killer of yourself doing that. And actually it's so funny when sometimes you ask the patients, do you stop smoking? And they say, yes. Say, when was the last cigarette you, you smoked yesterday? Okay, fine. So that's because it's eight in the morning, you're in hospital, probably you didn't smoke. But you know, this, this kind of good result needs to be carried on for at least a few months, you know, before being really happy about you having stopped smoking. Oh, as a consultant, you are in fact responsible for your patients. So how do you handle compliance? We talked a little bit about smoking, but what about medications, even diet and exercise? Of course, it's a, it's a, it's a multi-level treatment, and you try to address, you know, the, the right uh, uh, the right uh, uh, thing for the right patient. For example, people who are overweight, maybe you focus more on the diet. People who are really skinny, but they smoke like a chimney, as we say here in the UK. So you have to focus on smoking. So every time you have to have an idea of two to three things which are the main ones, because you can't attack the patient on 10 different things. It will be like nothing. You know, it's like doing a presentation for doctors and just try to take, you know, 10 take home message. It's too mm -hmm. much. You have to have one, two or three maximum things that the patient needs to change, some attitudes that they need to, 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 to change. If you don't get these three, then you know, you know that these are the main ones and the patient won't be uh, a success. If you are able to target few important issues, then you know that your treatment probably gonna you're gonna give long term results. Because here in the states, that is the number one problem. It's compliance. We cannot get people overall to comply, especially with diet and exercise. Those two are the toughest to get people in compliance with, and one of the main reasons is they don't have a regular dietitian or nutritionist that they're assigned to go to on a regular basis. Is that something that is available in the UK to people? No, I mean, not really. So it's mainly, of course, there's a, there are dietitians, but this kind of one-to-one um, -one care sometimes is missed. 
So this is not just seeing the dietitian once every two months. It's more like a continue uh, input uh, for the life of the patient to, in the way to, of course, sometimes people are like 60 and they don't have a way, even a mental way to, to, to change their attitudes uh, for food, so that you know they're eating junk food, you know, uh, you know, oh, it's no good. <laughs> uh, no good. But it, it, to change this kind of attitudes and to change yeah. this kind of habits, it takes time and takes effort. So you can't do it like seeing the patient once in a while and say, "Oh, you know what? You need to change your diet." Full stop. No, this this doesn't work. And that's a, that's a big problem. So, what would be your suggestion for patients? Because how do you know what to eat, what to not eat on a daily basis when you're going to restaurants where there's so much to tempt you? No, I mean, it's really difficult, especially for diabetic patients where, you know, the glycemia could be really badly controlled and more uh, sugar in the blood means more plaque, means more disease, means yeah. more, you know, progression of the vascular pathology. So it's a really difficult uh, task. Uh, of course, you can give them support, there are support groups, of course, which are really important. There are ONG, which are working for that. There's also, you know, the, the, the support and the family can give it to you. So sometimes you, it's good to talk to patients, also talk to, I don't know, grandnephew or, you know, brothers and sisters or, you know, relatives, just to try to, you know, uh, get them on board in the treatment outside from the hospital for these patients. So when we're talking to patients about not just their treatment, but about diet and exercise there do you have any suggestions on how we can help them to talk to their doctor or to get that sort of support that they need from their doctor or from the healthcare system any advice on how to navigate to better get that information i mean like in uk of course it's a it's good also to have a patient support group so these patients, they meet together and they can share experiences. And also if the suggestion come, comes from a, a patient or from someone who was a patient, who was in the same situation as you, it's far more powerful than a doctor, you know, in a white coat saying you should stop smoking. Mm -hmm. If someone who has smoked 40 cigarettes a day for 25 years says to you, you know what, you should stop smoking. I was in the same situation as you. I stopped and I feel now the benefits of it it completely change, it changes you know, the way that the patient is receiving the message. So it's really important to, to you know, uh, support the support groups and to, to deal with patients because it's, it's, it, it's a completely different approach. Believe me, it, 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 it makes really a difference. But you have to be careful of kind of, and I, I'm not trying to say this in a derogatory way, it's just a saying here, but it's kind of like the blind leading the blind though if there isn't a one-stop shop, a place that has the expertise and the credibility with information you can totally trust versus just oh, Of course, no, no. The, these, these patients' group needs to be coordinated by a doctor, of course, and it's also these patients usually who are joining these groups are highly motivated. They want, want to go deeper in understanding the pathology. So, I mean, my experience is that these patients were leading the, the groups are patients who are well educated and also there's always there's always a doctor or some doctors behind them so they can always you know um ask for for advice or they can always be guided by these doctors oh that's really important kind of a fun question here a lot of the doctors are into the internet of things or iot basically you know the um, the Fitbits and, and things like that of the world. Do you have any fun consumer technologies that you give your patients or you suggest that they use in order to maintain their compliance, whether it's an app to manage their diet or a Fitbit, for example, to manage their exercise? Hmm, actually, we don't. It's a good idea, actually, you gave me. I think we're probably, compared to US, UK is a bit behind from this kind of app you know, point of view. Sometimes patients, you know, they don't even have a smartphone. So it's difficult for them even to understand, you know, how to call the doctor. And it could be even more difficult to, to manage their diet with an app. But mm -hmm. I think for, you know, more and more patients, this could be a really important support to their lives and to their, you know, healing time. Right, definitely. There's a, a, an app called We Run, which is really a motivational app for exercise. And it sets the beat of your music, your favorite music, 
to your pace. And so the faster you walk, <laughs> the more apt it, 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 the app is to play your music at the pace that you like or the beat that you like. Ah, okay. That's nice. Yeah, that's a good idea. It's, it's really fun. But is there any final advice that you have for patients? The critical questions that they can ask their doctor will start first if they don't feel heard and they want to be diagnosed. And then the second aspect of it is about their treatment. So what can they ask prior to going in for an angiogram when it comes to stents or atherectomy tools or approaches? So they can determine if that doctor is right for them. So we'll start with diagnosis first. Yeah, diagnosis is really important for patients who get the right diagnosis. As we said before, the first level is the patient to be aware that they can have vascular disease, to go to the doctor. So they need to access the doctor, they need to access their GP or their local doctors to say, I think I have a problem. The second thing is like to, once this is assessed, and also the doctor in, in, the, in the GP practice can do some tests to understand if really the patient is affected by any kind of vascular pathologies to find the right doctor for the right treatment. And that's why I strongly suggest people to try to go to centers which are high volume that means you know, there are high specialized doctors who are working every day with these pathologies. They are fighting every day against these diseases. And uh, once, if they want to go to a local uh, place where, of course, they feel more comfortable with going up and down, if they get the diagnosis, which is like, there's nothing we can do but amputation, always, always, always ask for a second opinion. You know, I mean, I, we can't save 100% of the legs, but I think we can do a lot for many of them. And what about in terms of treatment? So we talked a lot about the different technologies, different approaches. Um, hey doc, can you do both antegrade and retrograde? Hey doc, is stenting your frontline treatment or only for bailout? Um, hey doc, do you do a bullet chase? Do you do the full runoff to check full outflow after a procedure? Any of those types of things that you would suggest to make sure that they're getting the best treatment possible? I think if you go to a high specialized center, you don't even have to discuss about these things because especially in UK, where high volume centers are always doing this kind of things as a matter of standard. So if you try to access these centers where there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a good diabetic food team or there's a good you know, critical limb ischemia group, then I think these are things that don't even have to be asked because the doctors know what's best for you. If you're going to a hospital where the operator does, I don't know, let's say 20 procedures a year, so that's the way not to get the best treatment because this doctor, nothing against him, but he won't be what we call a CLI fighter. Someone is fighting every day for this pathology. And it's impossible this doctor will give you the same treatment which could be given to you in a high volume center, uh, you know, when, when a doctor with high level skills, you know, is on your leg. And any final pieces of advice or anything that keeps you awake at night that you really, really want patients to know? I really want to know that we can do a lot. It's all about you mainly. You come to us, we give you our skills, we give you our experience, and then we give you our support. At that stage, it's you. You need to be first aware that we can do a lot of something together. And the second thing is like, the, this, this disease is not a disease which is like a flu. It's something you're gonna carry on having during your own life. And you need to be motivated to try to do your best to keep your legs where they are and to, to be independent in your life. Walk, 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 grow those collaterals. A lot of people don't realize that they can actually grow little lifesavers in their body. Of course, yeah. The body is clever. It's always clever. The, the body is always trying to find a way to, to get around the disease. Yeah. And so just keep walking. Thank you so much, Lorenzo. Really appreciate you. And if people want to contact you, what's the best way for them to reach out to seek possibly a, even a virtual case review? Ah, for us, it's really important. Uh, we have loads of contacts. We have a website. We are in West uh, Northwest London. We are the West London uh, Vascular Interventional Center. 
and uh, you can find us really easily on internet and uh, as you can find me on Facebook as Lorenzo Patrone you can find us uh, on all the social media and we are happy to provide second opinions and to see patients straight away for example we launched really recently a hot clinic in the afternoon but patient can you know almost a walk in if they have a peripheral disease and uh, and uh, CLI especially so it's a walk in service it's a, I think it's something important for patients that don't have to wait forever to see a doctor. They can go and see us, get the diagnosis, and maybe get a treatment. That is so amazing. Thank you so much.